Peter, I believe that Kelly J uh, insists that trans women are not female. Where do you stand on that? Well, of course, as I said, there's a distinction between biological sex and gender identity. And in my view, both are valid. It is valid yeah, to affirm valid. your biological yeah. sex. It's also but, valid to affirm second, your Kelly, gender you identity. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's valid to affirm your biological sex and it's valid to affirm your gender identity. Uh, Kelly J, your view on that? Well, Peter uses this uh, euphemistic phrase of live and let live. And um, I think that when we say that, when we're talking about women's rights, is women have to live and let others live uh, by just pushing themselves aside to allow men uh, completely to erode our spaces. Uh, when you talk about uh, it's the same as black or you compare it to black rights, uh, it would be like we have to say that black people are white. Uh, and so the comparison is, is rather obscene uh, and moderately racist. Um, when we're talking about female rights and we have to then use these caveats of including people that aren't women in women's rights, i.e. men, we erode women's rights. We erode the way that women can speak about ourselves and our rights. And I think it's just, uh, it's just deeply misogynist. Uh, there is no other way that you could ask a group of people to forego their own rights for others. Uh, nobody would be expected to do it in any other sort of minority or majority group. Uh, do, you, do you feel- well, can I just- so, Go ahead, uh, uh, Peter, sorry. Yeah. I, mean, I don't see the evidence that women's rights are being eroded. For example, I've got a friend who works in a women's centre who is accepted trans woman in that centre by a vote of the staff and of the women users. In so six all years women since... Who uh, use look, can you let me finish? Yeah, yeah, can you yeah, let, let me finish? Yeah, Kelly, let I will finish, get, I'll, let, I'll let you get a chance. Don't worry. OK, fine. Uh, in six years, there has never been a problem. The presence of trans women in that women's centre has not taken away any rights from the women there. Those women, uh, trans and not trans, recognise they both experience misogyny. They both are big, big, often victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. And therefore, they understand that they have a common interest in working together to challenge those forms of oppression. I'm going to come back to you in just a little while, Kelly J. But let me just ask Peter: Where do you, you know, it is a fact, Peter, uh, that uh, women, a lot of women, do feel threatened by the idea that uh, a transitioning male that uh, who's identifying as a female are allowed into their changing rooms, you know, are allowed into uh, the, the traditional female areas. There's talk uh, today that uh, trans women uh, will be allowed into women's hospital wards. Uh, it is a fact that a lot of uh, women, uh, I get in trouble for saying this, but it is it does help in terms of dif differentiation a lot of cis women feel threatened by that and feel very uncomfortable about that. Uh, I'm talking also about, you know, sharing uh, women being allowed, uh, trans women being allowed into uh, cis women's toilets. I mean, what are we going to do about that? I mean, because th that surely is an infringement. If, if, if cis women feel threatened by that, that is just a fact. Uh, what can we do about that? Well, of course, hundreds, if not thousands of trans women have been using women's toilets for decades without a problem. It's a kind of completely concocted fear and scaremongering, a, a demonization of a particular community. Having said that, I agree that women's safety is absolutely paramount. We must not sacrifice women's safety. But on the other hand, you know, where is the evidence? There have been a small number of examples of trans women who've done bad things. That is true but they are a tiny unrepresentative minority. We would, I hope, never demonize the Muslim community because of the terrorist acts of a handful of unrepresentative Muslims. We don't generalize in that way about Muslim people or indeed about black people or gay people or anybody else, but some people do demonize trans people on the basis of what a handful have done that is bad. Um, you know, the way to deal with that is to, of course, to identify those uh, bad people and to make sure they don't have access. So for example, 
if someone has a history, if a trans woman has a history of physical violence or sexual violence against women, of course, they should not be admitted to women's spaces unless there's very clear and incontrovertible evidence that they have reformed and are no longer a danger. But if that threshold has not been met, of course, they should not be in women's changing rooms. They should not be uh, using female toilets. They should not be in female prisons. Uh, Kelly J, I apologise for using the term cis women. I got in a lot of trouble on Twitter today. Uh, but in this kind of d discussion, it is handy uh, for the purpose of differentiation. So please forgive me for this. I'm not that keen on that phrase myself. Uh, we, we managed for many centuries without it. But uh, that given, uh, what is your response to what Peter says about uh, women's spaces uh, and the fact that trans women present no threat? Well, I think both of you men uh, encapsulate a point quite beautifully, which is due to the erosion of language, due to allowing uh, men being called something, a subset of women, we now can't even have clear conversations in what we're talking about. We are not saying that a specific group of men present a specific threat to women. We are saying that all men uh, proportionately propose the same risk to women so as soon as we obscure the language by calling some men this uh, word trans woman, which I don't feel makes any sense at all, uh, as soon as we use that word, we then can't talk about keeping women's spaces for women only. Um, cis is a word that is totally un unnecessary. If we just understood that women are women and nobody else is, then we don't need a prefix. Uh, and we could just stick to calling men men and they can stay in men's spaces it's not just about the safety of women it's about the dignity and privacy of women and right from the time that girls hit puberty women understand a very different pathway to men i don't pretend to understand what it feels like to be a man i've got three boys and a and a husband i have no idea really how it feels to walk around in their skin and i don't suppose they really know what it feels like to be me and so when you're a girl you go through puberty you have an exchange with the world where you do become somewhat public property. Your body, your breasts, walking around the street, seeing um, overtly sexualized images of women everywhere. It gives you a different currency in the world. And I don't think it's fair to then say that we have to give up any of our spaces, how we feel, the male gaze, our dignity and privacy, to men who feel that they need to be validated living as a woman. Uh, Peter, uh, you heard what Kelly J just said about uh, trans women being allowed into uh, traditional women's spaces, uh, that it wasn't a good thing. Is uh, what she says transphobic? I try and avoid those terms. I understand that feminists or some feminists, in fact, probably a minority of feminists, uh, are very trans critical. But most feminists, in my experience, and according to some of the polls, are not. They support trans rights, including the rights of trans women. Um, but as I, said, I, I don't go into using those terms. I, you know, I, I have a disagreement, but it's a respectful disagreement. And I, I do listen and hear what people like Kelly are saying. But I'd just like to add that I'm old enough to have been involved in solidarity with the women's liberation movement way back in the early 1970s. I can remember when the Women's Liberation Movement had their great protest against the Miss World Contest outside the Royal Albert Hall in late 1971, uh, the Gay Liberation Front, of which I was a part, brought along our contingent um, to stage uh, an alternative Miss World on the pavement outside. And this featured our trans activists who were dressed as mistreated, misrepresented, misused and so on to, to emphasize the way in which women had traditionally been put down. Now I can remember the women's liberation activists positively welcomed those trans women who did that alternative Miss World pageant. They positively welcomed them to the protest and thanked them. And it was absolute, an absolutely fabulous, fabulous spoof on the, on the actual official contest. So I, back then, Women's liberation had a very different set of ideas. I mean, back then, the women's liberation movement said that biology is not destiny. In other words, that a woman's biology should not predetermine her life chances and opportunities. But now some feminists seem to be saying that biology is destiny, that if you are born 
biologically a male, um, that that's all that counts. That you know the fact that you feel and act and you know live your life as a woman, as a trans woman, that is irrelevant. So really, those original ideas have been turned on their head, and I think it's very sad. But I'm still happy to continue the dialogue. Uh, well, we all are. Uh, your response to that, Kelly J? Well, I'm very happy Peter's continuing the dialogue also because. Uh, I see that we probably couldn't find a member of the trans community to actually speak this evening. Um, and so I'm really grateful. Well, that that's, you that's, that's, not, that's not a fair thing to say. We thought long and hard about how to do this. Uh, but uh, please continue. OK, all right. I'll stand corrected. Um, for a start, I'm, I'm not a, a feminist. I'm, I'm quite dismayed at the mainstream feminist movement who has seems to uh, have forgotten what actually being a woman is I, I find some of the language really difficult peter and perhaps you could uh explain a little bit more about what on earth uh, without using sort of stereotypes which i'm sure you wouldn't uh what on earth living as a woman might mean um how somebody born male actually is a woman uh why uh, my biology which dictates the fact that i uh, have reproductive capacity, uh, which is something that only women have. It's not all women have, but only women have. Uh, and no man uh, certainly does. Uh, the fact that women do most of the unpaid labor throughout the world, the fact that in poor countries, in poor households, in fact, in most households, uh, when it comes to unpaid labor, everybody seems to recognize which sex is the most appropriate to carry out those duties. And so when we're talking about living as a woman, are we saying that there are men uh, throughout the country who are doing the bulk of the unpaid labor, that are doing the more caring roles, that are doing the lower paid jobs? Um, are we saying that out in the fields uh, across the world, there are men with babies on their backs? Uh, doing backbreaking work. Uh, there are little male babies in uh, carrier bags on rubbish wastes in uh, third world countries like Pakistan. I mean, is, is this something that's widely recognized that we can just cho choose our sex? Or is this really uh, just a virtue of very privileged men, uh, very entitled men who feel that they can just demand that women completely concede the rights that we fought very long and hard for? Uh, Peter, your response? Well, the issues that Kelly has raised are absolutely paramount. You know, everything she's saying about the second class status of women legally, socially, culturally across the world is absolutely true. And of course, we should fight that. But I don't think that precludes the fact that we should also respect and accord rights to trans women and men as well. You know, it's, it's not either or, you know, all these battles we can fight together. And you've got to remember that, of course, uh, trans women um, do suffer like non-trans women, other women, um, you know, very high levels of domestic violence, uh, sexual assault and rape, uh, discrimination in the workplace. So they have some of the experiences of women precisely because they are trans women. And I just think we should, you know, not be seeking to highlight the divisions or the differences, but find the common ground where all women including trans women, can work together to challenge the misogyny that Kelly rightly identifies. Uh, can I sort of ask both of you, but I think I'll stick with you uh, first, Peter. Uh, can we get to uh, Laurel Hubbard and the issue of women's sports? Uh, as I say, I, I try and studiously uh, sit on the fence on this issue as uh, uh, an impressively unbiased presenter. Uh, but I do have a problem, uh, I think, with... Uh, uh, f trans women taking part in sports against women, uh, uh, particularly if they've been through puberty as males, uh, they will surely have more strength. Laurel Hubbard, uh, the New Zealand weightlifter, of course, is a very poor example because she turned out to be rubbish at weightlifting and came about 43rd. But that notwithstanding... Uh, where do you stand on uh, trans women taking part in women's sports? Because many women's sports w uh, players feel that in the end, that will mean the end of female sport as we know it. Well, again, this is an entirely legitimate and understandable concern. And I'm very keen to support those who want fair play in sport. But, you know, you've got to look at it across the board rather than just the stereotypes and the, and the exceptional individuals. Um, most trans women are not physiologically much different 
from other women. You know, they're not huge, great bulk, bulky, um, um, you know, individuals. You know, with huge bone and butt muscle. Possible exception of Laurel Hubbard. Sorry. Well, <laughs> yes, but 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 as as you said, yeah. that didn't help her one iota. You know, no. um, and a lot of these women, the trans women, their testosterone levels are comparable to uh, those of other women. Um, when I look at the English rugby women's rugby team, I see some mighty fine specimens of womanhood there, big, bulky, but not trans. Um, I can also see and, and know some trans women rugby, rugby players who, by comparison, are quite puny. So again, we've got to avoid generalization. And it's important to remember that all elite athletes, nearly all elite, elite athletes have some kind of physical advantage. You know, those with fast twitch muscle, muscle fibers uh, will be much faster and better at sprinting, but no one is saying they should be banned. Uh, likewise, those with extra large, large hearts or lungs will have an advantage, particularly in endurance and uh, fast paced sports, but no one's saying they should be banned. And, and athletes with extra, very tall and extra long legs, uh, they will have an advantage um, in basketball, but but no one's saying that they should be banned. So it's it's a bit odd to me the way in which trans athletes are being singled out for particular penalisation when all elite athlete, athletes usually have some form of advantage. Uh, Kelly, <laughs> well, I just find it quite incredible that we're pretending now that uh, the difference between men and women is somehow something that's just happened that just occurred to us, and the reason that. The Olympics has got male and female categories is just because they decided to one day and they're, they're not really uh, that important. Uh, all of this is just the same. It's just the same nonsensical, dishonest uh, narrative. And it's just not true. And I, I almost don't believe anybody who says that they think that it's true that that men aren't uh, bigger, stronger on average, and certainly in elite sports. If you compare the top flight uh, female rugby team against the men, they're infinitely smaller. It's quite, it, it's just preposterous that we have to pretend that this isn't real. Uh, can I just make one other point that um, I, I wanted to make earlier? And that is about all of this. Uh, we can talk about toilets, we can talk about uh, third world countries, I can bring in all different examples of where women and men are different in sports and so on. But what this actual whole movement is creating, this so-called trans movement, is it's creating little girls across the United States of America uh, with double mastectomies as young as age 12. So we can have these frivolous debates, we can have all these debates about these other things that are really important. But I, I don't think I would be fulfilling my duty as a women's rights campaigner if I didn't talk about the fact that we are literally slicing off the breasts of girls, uh, tens of dozens every day throughout the United States of America. And it will come here because that's what people are campaigning for. OK, Kelly, uh, Kelly, I'm running okay. out of time. I'm going to have to give uh, thank you so much. for that. I'll just give uh, uh, Peter one last uh, moment, uh, a final comment, Peter. Well, the slicing off of breasts, I mean, I, I, I've never heard of that at the age of 12. And certainly in this country, there are very strict rules and procedures that would not allow that to happen. Um, moreover, um, those who do identify as trans, whether they be male or female, have to go through a very rigorous, long, prolonged period of, of assessment, of counselling, to make sure that their identity is what they say it is, that they're comfortable with it, they're going to stick with it. And we know that those who get that counselling and support uh, and who enable, are able to transition, their mental health dramatically improves with much lower rates of anxiety, depression and suicide. And I think that that's what we've got to think about always. What is for the health and well-being of these trans kids and teenagers and adults? Let's make sure that they don't suffer by being denied the treatment they need in order to affirm their gender identity. Let's allow them to make that choice. And you know, no one is pressuring non-trans or other women to transition. No one is pressuring women in general to be trans. It's about individual personal choice. And I think in a free society, we should accept that and live and let live.